Remember, David's advisor said, well, babies are breaking down milk. So there must be digestive capabilities in the babies, and the question is, do premature babies have the same capacity? Well, David began to look computationally at what the proteins were being broken down into. When you do that, what you do is you run along the sequence of the various proteins and ask, what peptides are they making? And to their surprise, as they did this analysis, they found that, in fact, instead of breaking all of these proteins down into amino acids as nourishment from the baby, as his advisor said it would, that's not what happens at all. <laughs> Only a very few proteins are broken down, and they're broken down in very specific places. This is not the way it's supposed to work. So then, they took all the proteins, began to map. If they're broken, breaking down these very specific places, what could be doing that? What enzymes could be breaking that up? Now, jumped iron. University College Dublin sent us a marvelous computational biologist, Nora Caldi, and she studies databases of sequence and maps those to various structure function properties. And we asked her, could you take that and then tell us what enzymes could be breaking down the milk into these peptides? And she did that, and she came up with a group of enzymes that aren't in babies. So how could this be? Where are these enzymes coming from? So by being able to predict the enzymes, she said, well, these are the enzymes. The sequences are these. And then we asked Juan Medrano, who is studying the genes expressed in the mammary gland of mothers making milk, are these genes being expressed? Lo and behold, they are. One after another, where are these genes coming from to make the enzymes to break down milk, not from the baby at all, from the mother? Milk is a remarkable fluid. Not only is it, in fact, including all of these capabilities, all these proteins, it's self-digesting. These enzymes are breaking down milk in the baby. So we started thinking, well, how does babies break down milk? It's the other way around. Milk is breaking down itself. We then began to ask the question, what are they for? So do they have biological activities? For example, do they help the baby against bacteria? So we worked with Chuck Bevins in the medical school, and he's a pediatric microbiologist studying the bacteria that infect babies. He studies techniques to see, are the bacteria that are predatory to babies affected by these milk peptides? And lo and behold, they are. In fact, these peptides, some of them are protected for the baby from pathogens. But babies suffer from other problems. They are exposed to massive levels of new uh, potential allergens, and more and more babies, uh, especially uh, in the developed world, are suffering from autoimmune diseases, uh, various allergies. And the most visible, literally, is atopic dermatitis, a disease that when I was born, 2% of the population suffered from. Today in California, 30% of the population suffers from atopic dermatitis. And in fact, it's even worse than that. They suffer from very severe atopic dermatitis, some of them, so bad that it even inhibits their growth rates. So the growth of a very new disease. So in fact, does milk release peptides that might have an effect on that? So, Emmanuel Mavarakis, the leading pediatric dermatologist on campus, he's been looking at these peptides. Do they affect immunological development? Yes, they do. So in fact, what milk is doing is disassembling itself in the baby and releasing peptides that are guiding metabolism, guiding immunity, protecting it from pathogens. It's a literally encrypted biological system. So we're already bringing this to practice. practice. Nora has incorporated uh, these data sets into her little company. She's spun a company out to study protein uh, functionality in this way. And of course, we're looking, now, how do we make sure that these premature babies get this benefit? When you store milk, do the enzymes work? When you freeze milk, do the enzymes work? When you pasteurize milk, do the enzymes work? So already this is being brought to translation so that babies can, uh, can be healthy. So, the future of this kind of research, we know this requires spectacular collaboration, multi-disciplines working together. And I emphasize that. Success comes from bringing very different people together. And I can assure you, that creates tension. When you, produce, when you put microbiologists and chemists 
and geneticists and computational pe people together, there's stress. There's tension. That's how the success arises. It's explaining to each other what it is that you don't know that success comes. And so that's why bringing these two campuses has such great promise. There is going to be tension. My goodness, working with these Irish has been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's explicitly that tension that drives us to understand what we know, but mostly understand what we don't know, and go after that. And, and we're delighted by this meeting to formalize this wonderful collaboration. Thank you. excellent and wowed with every presentation. And finally, we welcome Professor O'Reardon back to the podium, Director, UCD, Institute of Food and Health, University College Dublin, to talk about milk bioactives. Professor O'Reardon. Thank you very much, Audrey. I'm quite conscious of the time here, so I may go through this at a faster delivery speed than anybody is going to follow, but I think it, it's important we get ready for the, the main event for the presentation for Dr. Wateki. So bear with me if I'm going a little bit fast here. So in the talk, I'm going to focus on why dairy is so important to Ireland, and particularly mentioning an initiative, Food for Health Ireland, and then following on from Bruce's talk on um, human milk, looking at bovine milk and the bioactives and how we're trying to bring that to market in this large initiative which is Food and Health Ireland. So a very important change is going to occur in Europe um, in 2015 which is the end of the quotas for the producing of milk. So up until now Irish farmers were only allowed to produce a certain uh, amount of milk. That's going to change. So we have quite ambitious targets to increase the volume of milk we're going to produce by 50%. I would have to say there's a very uh, positive good feel factor in, in Ireland. Of course, there's always going to be disparity. For the most part, this is considered very positive and going to be good for the economy. And just over the past 10 days, I just looked at some newspaper clippings to give you an idea of how this is much to the fore it is in the Irish news. So um, here you will see um, our teacher, was, which is the equivalent of your, your president, two senior ministers traveling to what is a relatively small dairy in the south of Ireland to open a, a large expansion of their dairy plant with the government investing heavily in this. So this is the importance of this in, in Ireland. We've seen a, a smaller dairy also um, meeting with uh, Chinese officials and trying to impress the fact that Ireland should be the country of choice for milk that China will import. We've seen Glombia, one of the largest dairy companies in the world, making a, a large acquisition here in the US. And again, part of this is in anticipating that we'll have larger volumes in milk and putting it towards the very void sports nutrition market. And then we even have a headline saying that there'll be an overhaul of taxation. And I can tell you with the climate we have in Ireland at the moment, to be doing anything on tax um, is, is quite un unusual. But again, it's to entice farmers to produce more milk. So I think that's setting the scene that there is a lot of focus of dairy in Ireland at the moment. And one of those initiatives, um, again funded by the government, is Food for Health Ireland. And this initiative was set up in order to develop world-class research facilities in Ireland focusing on dairy research. It's quite unique in its setup. It's a partnership between six universities and Chagas, which is a food research centre in Ireland and five Irish dairy companies, all competitors in the marketplace, sitting at the same table, all vying for the same final market. It's uh, funded by the government agency Enterprise Ireland. They fund 75% of the, of the initiative industry fund the remaining quarter. We've had five years to date of this initiative with an investment of 22.5 million euros and last year kicked off the second phase with again uh, in and around the same sum being invested. And it's just to stress that this is very much an industry-led agenda. Yes, we want good science. Yes, we want papers in the best journals. But the industry agenda is what's dominating. So in the talk today is just going to highlight some of the challenges there are 
in having this industry-led agenda and the change in mindset that's required in order to translate science into um, commercial products. And I think, as, as Bruce just said, we're in the business of keeping healthy people healthy via food products. If we're going to do that, we have to reach out to society, we have to have products that they're going to be able to consume. So this is a center that ultimately wants to sell the product. It's not just about the science, you have to sell the product at the end of the day, which is a, a tall order. So we're very much focused on what the consumer needs, right across the life cycle from prenatal care right through to the elderly. The premise is that we will pay more for foods with uh, functional health benefits. If we see something that produces cholesterol, the figures are showing that we'll pay somewhere between four to 10 times what we will pay for a normal product if it has a health benefit. So it's with a view to increasing the value of milk is what the center is ultimately about. I'm using the term here, reverse engineering approach for the program because it is market led. So there's very nice science being done in terms of the generation of the bioactives, high throughput assays, human studies, but ultimately, if it's felt that this can't make it to market, if a company said, we honestly can never produce that bioactive project, it's cut. <coughs> you bruise my things that they're, they're attended as an interdisciplinary team, I can't explain to you the tensions it causes when someone is told, you've done fantastic science, your citations are brilliant, but guess what, we can't sell the product, so science is gone, sorry. And that's what happens. So to talk to you so, some of this, so being clear, the deliverable, it is novel bioactives with very good science supporting it, but we have to have commercial manufacturing processes and commercial products at the end of the day. And this bit is a lot easier than these two. So the platforms are in three main health areas. Metabolic health, particularly focusing on appetite control and glycemic control, aging and sports performance, and then infant nutrition, and that includes uh, care during pregnancy for um, the mother. The five contributing companies all, as I say, have a very big say on how the program is run. And I'm just going to briefly talk to you today of, of some of the work that we're doing in this technology platform. And this is the platform that is supplying everything into the health pillars for the nutrition studies to take place. And the big challenges for the technology platform is one, design the milk bioactives. Second, trying to ensure that what they're designing is going to have the effect that you think it's going to have when we consume it and so that it will have its physiological efficacy that you're expecting. And finally, can we put it into a food structure the consumer is going to, to buy? So very briefly going through some of these, in designing the bioactives, there are a number of approaches taken. I'm just